Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here to speak about unknown unknowns and how to know them. Um, I'm Dylan Ratcliffe, the founder and CEO of Overmind. I was also previously a professional services engineer at Puppet for six years. Um, but before I get into anything, uh, first I want to start with the story of how a printer made me quit my job. So while I was a consultant at Puppet, I was working for a week at a company that will remain nameless, um, but the gig was going really well and I wanted a big win before we left. Now, at the time, every single user had the same root password. Uh, sorry, not every user, every server had the same root password. Uh, this was a sort of secret arcane knowledge that got passed down to you on your first day in the operations team and you were told never to write this password down and don't tell anyone because it hasn't changed in 10 years and it's not going to change for another 10 years. And uh, it wasn't great. So we were planning to deploy triple SD. That would mean that users would log in with their actual username and password rather than this shared root password that everybody knew. And it would give us nice stuff like a user would lose access when they leave the company and good things like that. So the plan was to deploy this to all of production on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. Now, I know that's a bad idea. And I knew that it was a bad idea at the time. But it was the last day of the project and we wanted to get a win. Plus, we were legitimately confident that it was going to work. We had done all of the testing that we could possibly do. We had gone and got all of the approvals that we needed to get. So it was fine, sort of. So we pressed the button, we deployed the change, and we watched the results come in. And it was coming, out, coming back green, green, green. We tested and we could log into the servers using this old root password still, but we could also log in using our actual username and password. And we could disable that old root password later, but nobody was locked out, which was important. Um, and at this point, all we really had to do was wait. The results were still coming in and we just had to sit there and watch. And we're about T minus 90 minutes from when we were planning to go to the pub. And at T minus 45 minutes, the phone rang. And the, the call said, hey, nobody in the department can save PDFs anymore. The whole department is at a standstill because we can't save PDFs. And I thought, what? How could we have broken the ability to save PDFs? We didn't touch any laptops. We didn't even touch any Windows computers at all. All we did was enable Triple SD on the back end Linux fleet, which really should have had nothing to do with it. And so I asked, What do you mean? Tell me what you do. And they said, Well, I go file, print, PDF, printer, print, and it's not there. And I said, Don't you mean file, print, save as PDF, save? And they said, No, file, print, PDF, printer, print. And so it turns out that at this company, if you go file print, you get a list of printers, which are all physical printers in the office, and then there's a printer called PDF printer, and we've broken that, whatever that is. So now we had to work out what it was um, and how we'd managed to break it. So the first thing was we'll ask around, and we asked around, and nobody had any idea what this thing was. But the team had a wiki, and in the wiki they had a whole bunch of information about everything they were responsible for and all their processes and how to upgrade it and all that sort of stuff. So we checked the wiki, and there's nothing in there. But they had a CMDB, and they've got all of the information for all their servers in the CMDB. So we checked the CMDB, and there's nothing in there. And so at this point, we're sort of running out of options and so we decided that we were going to log into this printer and see if it would let us in. And so we did. We SSH to its IP address and it gave us a login prompt. And so we typed root and then that root password that everybody knows. And it let us in. 
And so what followed was a particularly complicated session of infrastructure paleontology where we were trying to work out how the bones of this thing fit together when it was alive. Um, and much like regular paleontology, it's much more tedious and much less interesting than Indiana Jones makes it look. But eventually we worked it out. It turns out that about 10 years ago, somebody put a physical server in the data center and this server's job is to pretend to be a printer and when somebody prints to it, it saves to a PDF and then it runs a script which picks up that PDF and moves it to a mount point and that mount point is a network share which is also available on the laptops which is mounted to people's home directories on their Windows laptops which means to the user they go file, print, PDF printer, print and a PDF appears on their laptop but what's actually happening is it's doing this horrible dance all the way around the network and back again. And we'd broken that. And so we had to work out how to fix it. Um, I won't go into that, but it turns out the fix was to change thousands of permissions on the network share, which is obviously a fairly terrifying fix to run. It was a, a, a roll forward rather than a roll back. Um, and so we wanted to work out whether this fix would make everything worse. But given that we only learned about this, this printer an hour ago, there was essentially no chance we could have worked out whether anything else depends on this process. And by this point, everybody else had gone home, so we weren't, gonna, weren't going to make it any worse, so we just decided to do it. And it worked, and everything was fine. We didn't break anything else. You could save PDFs again. And and everything was okay. Not before the entire department, which hadn't been able to get its work done, had already gone home, not having got done any of the work they needed to get done before the weekend. So it wasn't brilliant, but we managed to get to the pub about an hour and a half later than we were supposed to. So when we got to the pub, we sat down and thought about, could this have been avoided or if not avoided, at least, could we have done a bit better job of picking up on it and fixing it? Um, and we decided that certainly we would have never thought to test for this beforehand, because this whole situation is so stupid that surely nobody would ever do something like that. If future Dylan came from the future and said to me, hey Dylan, before you do this production deployment, you should check to see if there's any servers pretending to be printers that receive print jobs and then save it to a PDF and move it onto a thing and run a script and it goes onto a network share and appears on people's laptops, I would have said, no, I'm not checking for that because it's so dumb. And if I check for that, then I have to check for every other possible thing under the sun. I'll never get any work done. So we wouldn't have not done this, um, but we could have probably done a better job of working out that we'd broken it and fixing it. Um, this is a perfect example of an unknown unknown. It's something that we didn't know that we didn't know. It's so esoteric that it's probably never going to happen to anyone else ever again, I certainly hope. But it's, a cl it's part of a class of esoteric problems that happens actually quite a lot. And each one of those problems is probably never going to happen to anyone ever again, but there's always a problem like this. And I realize that in general, our industry is not particularly good at dealing with these sorts of problems. We don't have great tools for this sort of thing. And I thought that I had a way to fix it. And so I quit my job and I started Overmind. Um, before we talk anything about the solution though, we need to get some more background on the problem. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about what mental models are um, I'm going to go over the Stella report and what it tells us about the relationship between mental models and outages. I'm uh, going to talk about the enduring legacy of unknown unknowns and how it can slow companies down to a crawl, and then what we can do about it. <coughs> so, a mental model is what allows us to predict what the outputs of a system will be for a given set of inputs. For example, I have a mental model of how driving a car works. 
I know that if I press the accelerator, the car will speed up, and if I press the brake, the car will slow down. Now, I didn't build this mental model by taking a car apart and looking at all of the individual pieces and working out how they were going to interact and then making a prediction. I created that mental model through experience, through driving a car. Um, and this is how our mental models of our applications and our systems are built as well, from experience in operating them, not from first principles, at least usually. And just like no amount of driving a car makes you a mechanic, these mental models that are built from experience in operating systems don't prepare us for when things go wrong. So Wood's theorem states that as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent's own model of that system decreases rapidly. Uh, Woods himself conducted a workshop, uh, and the report is called the Stellar Report. I thoroughly recommend giving it a read. If you just Google Stellar Report, you'll find it. Uh, but what they did was they looked into a number of large outages and the role that mental models played, and they found these five things that were common across every single outage. In every single case, each anomaly arose from unanticipated, unappreciated interactions between system components. There was no root cause. Anomalies arose from multiple latent factors which combined to cause a problem. The vulnerabilities themselves were present for weeks or months before they played a part in the evolution of the anomaly. They were activated by specific events, conditions and situations and those activators were minor events near nominal operating conditions or only slightly off nominal situations. And in all of these cases, it caused what uh, Woods calls fundamental surprise, which is in where the situation that you're presented with <coughs> refutes your most basic beliefs about how the system works and it forces you to rebuild your mental model to take these things into account, i.e. it was caused by unknown unknowns. I'm sure a lot of us have been in that situation where you've looked at how a system is behaving and thought, that's not possible, or you've changed something and something's broken over here and you've thought, that's not possible, those things aren't related. Like, it's not possible to break the ability to save PDFs by implementing SSSD. Turns out it is. It refuted my most basic assumptions about how the system worked and I had to start from scratch. And I don't think this is a coincidence that these outages tend to do this, that they tend to be caused by unknown unknowns. I think that outages will always happen at the edge of your mental model with the things that you don't know that you don't know. Because if you knew about them, you wouldn't have got yourself into that situation in the first place. Even if you only know that you don't know something about how a system will behave, you can still prepare for it. That is a known unknown. If I know that I don't know how my application will behave with this new version of a database, I can prepare, I can do testing, I can do research, and I can move it into the known knowns section. So, doesn't this mean sort of by definition that it can't be solved because these are things that we don't know that we don't know, and if we can even think of them, then they're not unknown unknowns, they're known unknowns, and we can prepare for them. And it's actually worse than that. So as we improve our mental models of our systems, we end up understanding and preventing all of the simple ways that it can break, which leaves the complex ways. And so by improving our understanding of our systems, we're actually making outages more complex. To be fair to us, we are probably making them less common, but they are becoming more complex. Servers are not running out of disk anymore, they're running out of entropy, which is much more difficult to debug and much more of a pain. And quite possibly something that you didn't know that you didn't know that a server could run out of entropy. I know I didn't know that I didn't know that until it first happened to me. And so this isn't even the worst part. 
management have not got wind of this yet. And when they do, they do this. <coughs> so we know that outages are caused by unknown unknowns. But think about how it must look to management. We followed all the processes and something still went wrong. So how do we fix that? More processes. This leads to a process that basically amounts to getting so many fingerprints on the gun that when it does finally go off, you can't pin it on anyone. Uh, it's called risk management theater, and this is how it works. Firstly, a company experiences an outage and then adds more process to try and avoid that outage in the future. That increases the lead time for changes. Now, compared to high-performing companies, low-performing companies that participate heavily in risk management theater have a 440 times longer lead time. That leads to a lower deployment frequency. Lower deployment frequency means that changes have to be 46 times bigger if they are to keep up with their high-performing counterparts. Now, spoiler, they don't keep up with their high-performing counterparts, but the changes are still bigger nonetheless. Larger changes and less practice in doing them means that they're five times more likely to fail, and all of the above means that when things do go wrong, they go wrong in a big way, and they take 96 times longer to recover from. And this is the real demon here. It's this feedback cycle that causes companies to grind to a halt. If you imagine I was to go back to that company that I spoke about with the printer thing and do a production deployment, there would be a step in the process where before you touch production, you print a test page on all of the printers, and then you do your production deployment, and then you print another test page on all the printers and go and collect them and make sure they all still work. And these are the sort of organizational barnacles that grow and grow and grow. And because this, feed, this cycle feeds back on itself, it's very easy to get into uh, sort of a tailspin with this and eventually have so much process that you can't do anything. And um, this is the thing that I, I, I dislike most. Uh, this is the thing that I disliked about being a consultant is seeing this, seeing people not be able to achieve what they should be able to, seeing tools be, not be used in the way they should because companies were too afraid to change stuff because of this. They'd had an outage, implemented more process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which had caused a bigger outage, which had caused more process, and the cycle repeats. Has anyone worked somewhere that has been affected by this? Show of hands. Currently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. For those of you that didn't show, uh, put your hands up, I... I envy you. I envy you. Hopefully you never have to deal with it, but it, you probably will. I'm sorry. And when you do, feel free to show them this slide. The numbers from this slide are from the Puppet State of DevOps report in 2017 because it focused on uh, risk management theatre specifically. So, how can we fix it? We've got good tools for using our mental models when smaller problems occur. If we look at observability tools, for example, they let us see our outputs in detail so that we can apply our mental model and infer what must be the internal state of the system for it to produce those outputs. But it doesn't really help us to build a mental model. Um, the Stellar report found that in all instances that they studied, Despite companies having good observability tools and other abstractions, the building mental models work was done using exclusively low-level primal tools, namely the command line. Um, and what are we doing when we're using the command line? Normally, we're not looking at outputs because we already have the outputs in our observability tool. We're looking at the inputs, at the configuration. Um, a potentially dubious but nonetheless sort of right-feeling statistic, it's from Gartner, but I don't know how rigorously researched it was, is that 80% of all outages are caused by configuration. And also configuration is where all of the how the application is supposed to work information lives. 
And that's what helps us to rebuild our mental models. And that's why we go there when things go wrong. It, configuration contains things like, what database server is this supposed to point to? What security group do, is this thing in? And what are its rules? Uh, when was the last time it was changed? Who changed it? What was the previous value? If we had tools that monitored our inputs, as well as observability tools that monitored our outputs, we'd be able to do things like, immediately look at whether a setting has changed or not. We could find out every setting that has changed in the last hour and work out whether any of them could have caused the weird behavior that we're seeing. We could build mental models on the fly before making a change. If we had to change a security group, we could discover which components use that security group and then which applications those components are a part of and work out a reasonable blast radius before we actually go ahead and do anything. And so, I'm sure that some of you are thinking at this point, I've got good documentation, I've got config management, can't you just read the code if you want to understand the system? And these things can sort of help mitigate the problem, but they're not really solutions. So, Documentation, for example, is basically the best way that we have of taking our mental model and putting it down on paper so that somebody else can sort of import that mental model into their brain when they need to. However, docs have problems. We know that our, do our docs have problems. Um, would anyone like to bet that their docs are completely accurate right now? <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, there's also config management, as I'm sure you all know, which can get you some of the way. If you've got really good coverage of your config management, you can sort of look at the code and work out what the inputs are, but it does have limitations. For example, for the Puppet people in the room, what does this Puppet code tell us about the permissions of our Nginx config file? Anyone? It doesn't, it, well, in this case it isn't, but you're correct in saying it doesn't tell you anything. We're not telling Puppet to manage the permissions on our config files, so it doesn't care. But changing the permissions on our Nginx config file could absolutely break Nginx. If we made the permissions such that Nginx couldn't read its own config file, it wouldn't work. Um, also, Puppet's enforcing every 30 minutes, so you've got Oh, hopefully. So you've got sort of some hope that what is in the code is probably what is on the system, assuming the agent is still running. But if you're using something that doesn't run regularly, if you run it using Ansible and you only run it when you need it, it might be three weeks since you last ran Ansible against that thing, so there's a good chance it might have moved. So even though it's in the code, it's not necessarily going to represent the real state of the system. Also, you really don't want to be spending your time tracing down where a variable came from and trying to work out what the value of this variable should be in this data center, in this application, when the whole system is down. You just want to see, show me the, what the config is right now. Um, the common thing, though, that means that these aren't the solution <laughs> is that they are an abstraction. And when we're building systems, this is a good thing. Config management is good because it allows us to abstract away infrastructure in the same way that developers can abstract away code. It allows us to sort of compartmentalize our mental models into easier to digest bits. For example, I know I can ask Terraform to create a load balancer and it'll give me a load balancer. Settings go in, load balancer comes out, I don't need to know exactly how it works. And documentation follows this pattern as well. We document the settings that go in and we document the load balancer that will come out and maybe some of the way that it works under the hood, but probably not everything and certainly not every instance in which it's used. But we have to do this to build systems. We have to put things behind abstractions and say, this generates certificates. I don't care how, I just know that it will give me a certificate if I ask. But when we have to fix systems, 
we know that the problems tend to occur outside of our mental models, which means they're going to occur in the gaps where the abstractions that we've created meet, because those are the bits that we don't understand well. Those are the bits that are outside our mental models. So we can basically guarantee that that's where the outages are going to occur. Um, as I said, the Stellar report found that even though companies, the companies that were studied had lots of abstractions that they used to interact with their systems on a day-to-day -day basis, they went straight for primal tools and raw data when things went wrong. And so documentation and config management can help to mitigate these problems, but they're not the solution. When things break, you're going to want the raw data. So what is the solution? This is what I've been trying to work out for the past 12 months. There's a few technologies that you could use today that get you a reasonable amount of the way. The first one is Cloud Query. Has anyone heard of Cloud Query? Quick show of hands. OK. So it allows you to dump the config of your cloud into a database. Initially, Postgres, um, now it supports a whole bunch of other stuff or files or, or whatever. And then you can query your cloud or clouds, whatever it is, using SQL. So it's a hell of a lot easier than, um, than learning how to do all of the API requests, especially if you already have tools for querying databases. Um, and so if you were to use Cloud Query to dump the state of everything in your AWS into a Postgres database every hour, you would suddenly have a pretty good record of how is everything configured and how has it changed over time. You'd be able to check quite easily whether a setting has changed, what settings have changed, that sort of thing. If you're using Kubernetes, it's probably even easier. You could use kubectl to just dump all of the YAML out of a cluster and stick it in a Git repository every hour and do a commit. Um, these sort of, this might sound a bit dumb because it's uh, so simple. That would be like two or three commands to the kubectl thing. But it would solve some real problems. For example, do you know how to get a list of all the places a security group is used in AWS? This is a bit of a trick question uh, because there are entire blog posts dedicated to the topic of how to find where a security group is used. Uh, one little trick is you can try to delete the security group in the GUI and it'll tell you. It'll say, no, you can't delete it. Probably, probably it'll say that, otherwise it will delete it. Uh, and that will give you an idea of where it's used. I'm not certain whether that actually tells you everything, but it's, it's a start. Um, but if you had everything dumped to text files, it'd be very, I think we all know how we would search for where that security group is used. We'd just grep, and in two or three milliseconds, we'd have the answer of how many places is this security group used? Everywhere where S-3, A, B, whatever appears. Now, it's not everything, but it's a hell of a lot faster than querying the 20 APIs that you have to, to get that information out of AWS. Um, it's maybe not the most beautiful thing ever, but it's really, really easy. Um, and if it means that you don't miss something when you're updating a security group and it saves you an outage, then that's excellent. And this stuff is really very easy to do. Um, if you're using VMs and you're trying to get config off of machines, it's a little bit harder because you don't hit an API. But if you've got Puppet Chef or Ansible or anything else on the machine that can give you the machine state in some sort of reasonable manner, you can use that to gather everything about a server, say, before and after you run a deployment, and then compare those changes afterwards to make sure that they make sense. This could catch things like a service not coming back up after you've changed the permissions on the Nginx config file, for example. This sort of uh, process of sort of taking a snapshot before and after is uh, something that I learned from a customer when I was um, consulting. And it's actually a really, really good idea. 
using something like whatever it is that you have on whatever agents you have on your systems to dump out the current state and compare it means that when you make changes like patching where you you're do, making a change that really shouldn't have any effect it makes it much easier to gain confidence because you can dump all the state beforehand dump all the state afterwards, and if only version numbers of packages have changed, then your patching was probably successful. But if version numbers of packages have changed and these 10 services are now not running, maybe it wasn't successful. It gives you something to look into and gives you a way to build confidence. And these are all things that are free and really, really quite easy to do. The harder part is helping people to understand the relationships between things, which is really a critical part of a mental model, how things actually relate. And so this is what I've been spending most of my time on. The way that I think we do it, and the way that I've built Overmind to do it, um, is if I'm debugging, say, a website that isn't working, the first thing I'm probably going to do is use curl and hit that web endpoint, and I'll get some information that sort of looks like this. And there's a few breadcrumbs in here that I can follow to work out more about this uh, application. For example, I could use dig to find some information about the DNS entry. I could parse the certificate and look at what's going on in there. I could look at the certificate that signed that certificate. Um, and with each step, there's sort of more breadcrumbs and more breadcrumbs and more breadcrumbs, and that's what we do. I, probably, I don't need to tell you, you this. That's what we do when we're trying to rebuild our mental models and understand what's going on. We're following these breadcrumbs, but we're doing it manually. Um, what I've been trying to build is a system that can follow those breadcrumbs automatically. It can look at a HTTP endpoint, work out what queries it needs to make that are related to that, make those queries and expand and expand and expand. So I'm going to try a live demo here and we'll see how this goes. How do I mirror? All right, we're going to see how this goes. Um, so I'm going to try and demo um, what it would look like to do the uh, security group change, where I'm trying to work out where a security group is used so that I can confidently make a change to it and hope that it's not going to um, break everything. I don't have any Wi-Fi here, or maybe I do, or maybe I don't. Let's see. Or maybe I don't. Come on, Wi-Fi. <coughs> All right. Fine. I'll do it this way. This is not the way I wanted to do it, but I can prove that it does actually work if you come and meet me later. But Let's imagine that I have to go and uh, find out the details of a security group. Why is that massively zoomed in? Don't know. So I'd go to EC2, I'd look at my security groups, I would type in the name of the security group and get some details. Well, I don't know why that's zooming in like that. Um, from here, we don't get much information in EC2. It tells us about the name, which is not very helpful. This security group has got an outbound rule um, and it's got a tag which sort of talks about a cluster called dog food, so that's giving me a little bit of a hint, um, but it doesn't give me a whole lot. So if I go over to actions and go delete, it does give me some hints. Um, there's no <coughs> API for this, by the way. You have to click the delete button. Um, then it gives me the network interfaces it's related to, so I can click on that and I get some network interface -y sort of information, which is kind of helpful, but doesn't really tell me much about my, um, my app. And at this point, I'm pretty much at a dead end. Um, I followed all of the things that, all the breadcrumbs that it gave me. Um, so what I'm gonna show is the, the current version of Overmind 
what this looks like. I paste in the same security group and I get its details. Um, this is this has been make, this is making an AWS API call live. There's not a database here. Um, so it goes and gets the details. We can see the description is shared backend security group for load balancer, which is useless as the descriptions go. But if I double click it, it's going to look at everywhere that the everywhere that that security group is used from all of the data that it's seen before. One of the places it's used is this load balancer. Um, the load balancer is helpfully called ingress, another really poor name for a component. Um, and the details also don't tell me very much. But I can keep expanding. Because load balancers have targets, they tell you what their DNS entry is. I can map the targets, which are the IPs, and the DNS entry, which is that one there. Of course, I can do a lookup on the DNS entry, which returns me the IP addresses. This is all the same stuff I'd be doing manually, but just in a graph. We can then look at those IP addresses. They're related to network interfaces, which are related to that same security group, which I started with. So we're definitely on the right track. If I expand the IP address, we can find what other things refer to this IP address where we find a DNS entry. If we expand the DNS entry, we can work out what things use this DNS entry. It gives us a, an HTTP endpoint. If we expand that, we just get some certs because th the endpoint shows us some certificates. Um, but at this point, we've got actually a reasonable mental model of what this application is. There's an API called api.df.overmindemo.com which resolves to three IP addresses, or uses a DNS entry, which resolves to three IPs, which is the same as this load balancer. And that load balancer is used by this security group. The network interfaces are also related. So this is almost certainly what I would break if I was to break that security group. Um, if I wanted to know what happens on the back end, if I look at the ingress load balancer and have a look at the um, IP addresses that it points to, I could expand that as well, and then get the details of the EC2 instance that sits behind those IP addresses. And so this would tell me, if I change that security group, and where would I expect my monitoring to start yelling at me? Hopefully, it would start saying that this uh, EC2 instance is no longer getting traffic. Something's wrong, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so at this point, we've We've sort of done reasonably well. We've got pretty much a whole map of the configuration of this application. The important part, though, is that we did it without requiring anyone to put anything in from their mental model. We just started with the name of a security group and double-clicked and double-clicked and double-clicked. All of the links are generated just through following these breadcrumbs. And there's nothing that we've had to pre-configure in here in order to get this to work. And all of our solutions, whether it's this or whether it's something else, when things go wrong in the way that I was talking about, when they really go wrong, <coughs> our solutions need to not require, this by the way is just what a EC2 instance looks like if you let EKS provision it, it has a lot of IP addresses. Um, but if we're building solutions for this, the solutions need not to require us to have a mental model in order to use them because we know we won't have one because we know that the outage will have happened outside of our mental model. It will have caused us fundamental surprise and we will be in the process of rebuilding and re-understanding how this thing actually works. So. That is uh, what the tool looks like now. It's in early access. You can sign up. I really want feedback from people. It's, I, there's not, it's not something that you can pay for. I'm not expecting um, anybody to, I'm not expecting to charge anybody for it. It's not for a while at least. Um, but you guys are a great, uh, you sort of as close to my people as, as I think I'm going to get. And I would really respect your, uh, your feedback. So if you wanted to try it out and give me some feedback, I would absolutely love that. Back to what we have learned. So we know that outages always happen outside of our mental model. They happen with the things that we don't know that we don't know. Therefore, 
tools that require a mental model in order to use them don't help in these situations. Which means we need to make it easier to build mental models on the fly. If that means dumping your configuration file into a repo that people, uh, all of your config into a repo that people can read and search easily, maybe that's what it means. We need to make it much easier. We need to make it so that when things go wrong, you don't have to be, don't have to have massive, massive amounts of experience in order to navigate the command line, in order to work stuff out. We need to make it accessible for people to build those mental models without all the scars that we have, which we got from building them in the first place. Which means making our inputs more discoverable. So next time that you have an outage like this, think about how you can make your inputs more discoverable. Have a read of the Stella report. I really recommend it. It's excellent. Um, and that is all. Thank you very much.